Welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, we're talking with our guest Rowan Blizzard about Sustainable Development Goal 11, which aims to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Rowan is a solution seeker for Innovation House Australia. He's worked in small business, material supply and the construction industry and won several awards for his personal, professional and business achievements. He has direct knowledge of building for housing resilience and crisis response with first-hand experience in natural disasters like Cyclones Larry and Yazzie in Queensland, as well as the Townsville floods of 2019. Welcome, Rowan. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with Sustainable Cities. Sustainable Cities is um, a replication of um, single dwellings and uh, the knowledge and understanding around a single household can uh, massively improve people's uh, personal lives and that can scale up to cities, you know, towns, cities, whole of communities. So you're approaching that at an individual level rather than as a so we city work, planning level? Yeah, we def- definitely work with some councils and uh, I've got to give kudos to towns and city council in particular who over the years have been proven to be very progressive uh, with and without direct and indirect, indirectly to our involvement, have done some amazing projects over a 25-year span. Um, so it's a very progressive uh, particular council. Um, and we have always started from an individual residential uh, construction point of view and then tried to leverage that knowledge through the wider community. And it becomes quite interesting when you do any level of investigation around our housing yeah. that, that often we have copy and paste kind of responses rather than thinking about what's a response that suits the environment, the community we live in and the people that are living in it. Right, so we just have basic templates and we don't change them for the environment. That's... Yeah, and even over a 30-year period, those basic templates have hardly changed at all. Okay, so there's not really much advancement, despite obviously society advancing. Do you yeah. think, based on your experiences, that SDG 11, the sustainable cities, are achievable in the short to medium term in Australia? Absolutely they are. Um, In Australia, as an example, we have 10 million existing homes. Um, And then in a a construction sense, we might be able to build 200,000. It's in that order in a a good construction year. So the biggest change is in the existing dwellings. Often they've been built 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago where none of the current knowledge base was available. So uh, a classic case in point was a Queenslander was typically a high set house built out of timber because it was material available with a veranda at the front and the veranda at the back. Mm -hmm. A hundred years ago, we didn't have air conditioning or fly screens or big screen TVs and uh, comfy couches to sit on all day with the aircon running. So we would sit in the front veranda when that was in the shade. And that might have been addressing the street where we'd see the kids off to school, be able to talk to the neighbours while we had a cup of tea. Um, And it was an engaged society. When the sun uh, rose and and hit the west and and the front became uncomfortable, if that was the example, it then moved to the back veranda of the Queenslander house, which was shaded. And so you had some level of comfort. The human responded to the environment. Uh, Whereas now... Uh, the human don't need no responding to any environment. We just well, didn't, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we've basically insulated ourselves from the environment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which has also led to less engagement with our neighbours. We don't know who our neighbours are because we're not sitting at the front porch seeing the kids coming home from school, seeing all the other neighbours at the front porch either. So has housing construction changed much in the last 40 to 50 years? Um, some of the stats around our housing construction in the last 40 to 50 years are really quite sad. On the world stage, we now have the biggest houses. We probably have some of the most unaffordable houses on the world stage. Uh, we probably have the least technologically advanced housing. Um, so European nations 
have for some years had a air pressure test on their house when it's completed to say, yes, it's suitably airtight. Okay, um, yeah. And that's been a standard building practice for a number of years. And in European scenarios, that's often a benefit to keep the cold out. Yeah. I've actually heard from um, friends who have come and visited here from Europe who've said that Aussie winters are the coldest they've experienced simply because there's no keeping the cold outside. <laughs> yeah. So there's two basic design parameters to think about. One is to be completely passive and just let the environment and your housing respond to the environment without any interventions. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, there are really good examples of passive housing that allows for airflow, allows for shading, allows for heat to be retained um, in winters so that you have very minimal uh, need for mechanical heating and cooling. And uh, that is perhaps reflected in something like the star rating system, which talks about a, a star rating for a house from zero to 10 stars. Um, and the current standard is uh, six stars, talking okay. about moving to seven stars uh, for compliance. Right. And it's not a direct correlation, but broadly speaking, you could say that um, the higher the star rating, the longer the house is comfortable without additional intervention. Maybe at five stars, at least half the time you're going to have to air condition or heat the space. Whereas at nine and 10 stars, it might be down to less than 10% of the time you need to have heating or cooling cost. Right. Okay. And that has a direct disposable income impact. If Oops. you don't have to fork out electricity or gas bills, um, because, you know, for a very small fraction of the time, the house actually needs that intervention. That's not accounted for in the current system because banks don't actually assess your disposable income and ability to pay a mortgage based on how the house performs. They just look at your wages each week and use a formula to say, well, 2.3 kids, a white picket fence, a dog, you have these overheads. Um, therefore, you can afford to borrow that. Now, if you are in a really poor rental property, which has you know, very leaky performance in Canberra, you need a lot of heating in summer, a lot of cooling in winter, you have extraordinary um, utility and disposable income costs above you know, your rent cost, but that's not factored in anywhere to our current system. Right. So speaking about policy levels, is there any existing legislation that prevents inefficient housing being built, such as the star rating system? Generally, the tools that exist and the regulations are just tools. The industry response is to get to a compliance outcome. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the intention behind the star rating was to be a design tool to allow people to efficiently maximise the existing conditions to build housing that was responsive to the environment and needing less build cost and less uh, operational cost. In practice, nobody's doing any of that. Uh, in practice, uh, it's another compliance level. And so the builders work with their energy assessment designers to game the system to get uh, a compliance result. Right, so they're not actually adhering to the spirit of, of the regulations, they're just going, this is the bare minimum that we need. And, and the correlation is in all of the country, there's been, you know, you can count on one hand how many homes have been built to 10 star rating. Right. So yeah, not, not many. There's 200,000 homes built in approximately. And of them, there would be single figures built to anywhere near 10 stars. Have you ever encountered any legislation or regulations that actually make it harder to build sustainably? Um, uh, the world is full of <laughs> conflict and uh, one hand takes from the other. Um, and those conflicts exist everywhere. Often they're unintended, but generally policymakers have very blunt levers to pull. So they don't have highly nuanced or skilled levers to pull that give a result. 
they have very broad, simplistic levers to pull that maybe give a result. Um, and an interest rate setting is a really good example. I can see a vastly different impact between a regional community and a metropolitan community by the impact of interest rate settings. But as a policy level, they can't apply interest rate settings separately across Across the different geography. regions, right. Okay. So there are unintended consequences is what you're saying of all the different policies. And, and typically any legislation they put forward, you can get an economist or an accountant to forward a proposition and the government do, you know, this will do this. Now, almost never does is that the outcome. Right. You know, we're going to do this with interest rate setting, which will cause that. And we've been talking about affordable housing for 20 years. And mm -hmm. each year for 20 years has been a government policy that comes out that says, this is going to do something about housing affordability. And each year it's not delivered that. Yes, there's definitely, as you pro are probably well aware, of, a significant housing crisis in Australia at the moment. Um, what are some of the ways to, that you think could actually help that? Any solution starts with better thinking. So we have to have the conversation. And so these conversations are a really good starting place. We have to continue with that conversation when it gets difficult. 200 years ago, we decided to set up an Australian politics system. Um, we haven't changed it since then, but our society has changed dramatically. Our banking system is a highly regulated, um, has very few negative outcomes in a, as far as bank failures and impact on our national economy. So that stability is good, but its inability to uh, innovate and accept change is very restrictive. So the existing system we have is a lot of status quo, a lot of momentum in, in business as usual, and it doesn't encourage us to think, why is housing so unaffordable now? And from where I start today, in today's community, what could an affordable household look like? We're not two, point, you know, two parents with 2.3 kids and a white picket fence and fight over the dog. We're all these other crazy uh, examples of blended families, step families, single person households, casualization of the workforce, aging population, all of these factors have changed dramatically even over the last 30 years. So do you think part of the um, thinking needs to be changing the goalpost of having that big McMansion style house mm. all to yourself? Totally. But we have to give examples that people can aspire to that work or we just continue perpetuating the competition with the Joneses down the street and we all end up building McMansions. So, and I've heard this example in a display village overhearing a salesperson talking to a, a young family. And the question was put by the client, um, can we get a, an ensuite in the fourth bedroom? And the answer was, of course you can. Um, there's a cost. And of course you can put an ensuite in the fourth bedroom. My common sense says, who likes cleaning bathrooms? <laughs> That's very true. Like, like, who likes that? Um, and then from a construction point of view, they're the riskiest component of the whole house. And now you've built four of them. Right. Yeah. Like, if you want things to go wrong, the bathroom is the last place you want it to go wrong. You have the most amount of trades involved. You have the smallest amount of space. You have the highest level of expectation. And you have this incredible risk and now you're just adding another one because a consumer says, yeah, I want a bathroom for the fourth bedroom. Let's unpick that thinking. Now, yes. the Queen of England can probably afford uh, <laughs> a bathroom in a fourth bedroom. She probably doesn't do the cleaning and that might be a reasonable outcome for that client. Uh, there are plenty of clients that just we need to unpick that and say, what's your thinking here? Could we improve the main bathroom that's accessible for everyone? so that the person from the fourth bedroom felt it was an adequate solution without going and making another bathroom. I've seen people complain about class disparity where people who already have access to a down payment or family wealth or mm. such things are able to purchase a house and pay off that mortgage. So absolutely, it's, there is a, a haves and haves not situation increasing in the Australian community. 
the percentage of households that were owning their house uh, or you know, owned it outright or paying it off with a mortgage is decreasing. So there is an increase in, in people in the rental market because they can't get into the uh, owning housing market. I don't think it's necessarily all good versus bad. Oh, no, definitely absolutes, not. Absolutes. But it is certainly a case that families that have access to equity and deposits and multiple properties, which I don't think is necessarily inherently evil, it is a happening of circumstance in, in many cases. I would say that that's just simply a privilege that they have, that they're able to hmm. get into that market. Do you think that working from home has will, will impact the Australian housing market? Oh, absolutely. I hope so. So we've seen a lot of uptake of regional properties and, and with so with out-of-town buyers, and often that's Sydney and Melbourne, buying into the regions, which will take some time to flow through to what the effect of that is. When we move from Brunswick to Longreach and then can't find a suitable latte and the theatre doesn't show what we're looking for and this internet goes down two days a week, there might be some realisation of what that actually means, but that's not yet happened. Do you think that could bring infrastructure into those regional areas? The solution in the regions has to be driven by the regions. The governments don't have the capability and the governments necessarily want to consolidate everyone in nice little convenient metropolitan addresses where the infrastructure is. You know, we've got the hospitals, we've got the schools, we've got the highways, public transport. Um, doing that in rural communities uh, doesn't pay off at a government level. Um, right. And they don't have their big picture. They can't possibly be a regional community level of understanding. Yep, that makes sense. So... A few years ago, there was talk about building higher density housing along major transport routes. Do you think that that's still feasible? Oh, look, there is some beautiful examples. Uh, and if you look at the Nightingale example that started in Melbourne, there can be some really uh, magnificent responses. In, and I'm paraphrasing it, but in, in basic terms, they found a parcel of land that was on a rail corridor on the public transport system. And so they proposed to, I think it was in the order of 20 uh, resident owners, they said, we'll build this project without car parking. Uh, you'll use public transport. We'll have bike facilities, push bike facilities or e-bike facilities. Uh, we'll have a common garden on the rooftop. And these properties will not be for rental uh, occupants. So it's owner occupiers only. Uh, and in essence, they were able to give an agreement and built a fantastic response on a, right. on a transport corridor. Those examples you have to look for. Yeah. Uh, those examples aren't led by government uh, interventions. Uh, those examples take some higher level of thinking, but are, are completely doable. So what do you think are the biggest obstacles to um, examples like that, to sustainable housing becoming mainstream? Status quo is the biggest impediment, uh, and that applies to everybody. So governments are very comfortable with increasing property values in capital cities because every house and land package built in those capital cities, 40% of it is a government fee, tax or charge. Right, of course. When we give you back a home, first home buyer's grant or we give you a, an incentive we're not, you know, governments aren't giving you back more than they're actually taking out of that project to start with. Yeah. So there's, you know, if you take into account every level of stamp duty, payroll tax, GST, et cetera, et cetera, in each of those projects, if they increase year on year and the government takes 40% of it, their, their income is increasing year on year. Does that cause issues for existing homeowners who maybe can't afford increasing land rates? So ex existing property has to keep up. You know, that's how the market works, is if you have a three-bedroom, two-bathroom, double lock-up thing in this suburb and the build cost for a new one has to be this amount of money in this suburb, then I'm not saying this is correct because your house could be 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old and now have maintenance issues. But from a valuer's point of view, they will say they are equivalent. Right. So if it costs a million dollars in Sydney to build that thing in the Western suburbs, 
an existing thing that's 30 year old is about that value. That's definitely an, an issue for, for people who are homeowners who are maybe like pensioners. That becomes immense when you think of a pensioner in a uh, regional community. Regional communities are the house values are dramatically less, uh, uh, you know, maybe half. Mm -hmm. So if you have a regional resident who's at retirement age and they own they pay their property off over their 50 year working life and it's worth three hundred thousand dollars they can't enter a metropolitan address where they might want to go for a retirement village or a, a higher care medical needs or any of those issues. You now the kids have left the small rural town and now work in the big city. With their money that they've got from a, a regional house, they can't even enter. Yeah. Absolutely. Can't take a mortgage out. They've got about half the purchase price. They've got no option. With those um, legacy, like pre-existing houses that are older, do you think that it's good that we preserve them, despite the fact that they may have inefficient room sizes, or do you think we should be more focused on new homes? So if you look at the whole scale of the problem, there's 10 million of them in Australia, and you can do a lot for very little. So you don't have to bulldoze each one of them. For an example, though, Housing Commission stock in cities, which we no longer generally build, um, were generally made with hardwood frames that last in forever. They're compact, really simply built, and incredibly durable houses. So they probably would benefit from really simple modifications to bring them into community standards for today. So can you talk more about the useful life of a home? So my initial education and thinking was around materials and I would get fascinated and in love with this you know, great new material and it's the perfect thing for everywhere. And then I grew up and worked out that um, that's, you know, you can't be that simplistic. To call a thing a house, you have to have a test of a 50-year durability. So it's supposed to last for 50 years. And clearly there are examples of plenty of houses that last way beyond that. Um, the Romans built some stuff, you know, that's still going today, uh, thousands of years ago. So you can build structures, man-made structures that last and stand the test of time. And I'm not suggesting that we need to build all of our houses for thousand year lifespan, but the element that changes is not so much the house, it's the people living in it. So us as humans change our expectations uh, pretty regularly. And as a society, we've changed dramatically in a 30 year time frame. So it's probably worth thinking about uh, what was the original intent of this house? You know, what, why was this originally built? Um, and does it need to be kept current with how the people are trying to use it today? Yeah, does it fit the needs of the people who yeah. are living now? Yeah. Now, we like to think of that as, as a single house has many chapters. And if you think about this as just a general consumer, you might be a first home buyer, so you might be a young couple. And there's possibly not the need for four bedrooms when you first get together. Uh, you're probably fairly interested in one bedroom um, with maybe a second bedroom, you know, thinking about a child in the future, um, but why four? And then you change and you and kids do come along and they're young and they're in your house and under your feet and Legos everywhere. So you want, you want a corner for the Lego uh, and you have this high needs contained in, inside the space. Then 12 years go by and they start to be, or, or 18 years go by and they start to be independent. Uh, the independent as in we still love mum and dad's fridge, but uh, we don't actually move out from this address. But we, you know, of course, don't need to listen to mum and dad now. Uh, and so we probably want some space. So we don't, so this is the same address. How do we allow for that space? Then they start to partner up at 25 and 30. They're starting to find their own adult relationships and want these other people in the house again. So this house has many challenging chapters. And in your old days, you're sitting on the rocking chair, backwards and forwards, uh, think, you know, reflecting on your time at this address. Yep. A well-designed house can absolutely serve all of those chapters of life. And at the end of your time, your estate sells it, disposes of it, hands it down to a next generation of people to go through those cycles again. It doesn't have to be a big cost increase. It doesn't have to be a cost increase at all. It just takes thinking. 
So if you want to build a Taj Mahal monument to your ego, what is, what is the impact of that resource, land space, economic activity, et cetera, on your fellow community? When we started this uh, Australian settlement and you know, land tenure, we came from our lords and ladies and, and the aspiration as a human was to be the lord of your own domain. Mm-hmm. outright ownership of this and have all these serfs come and deliver you things at your address. And I think that's very old thinking. Uh, and I think generally we're seeing signs of much better community-minded thinking um, around the planet. So going back a little bit to the construction materials that you mentioned, do you think that it's they're more important or that the layout is more important? for sustainability? Uh, They are, of course, all interconnected. Um, But I think from a a human and a durability and all that we've already spoken about, the layout probably starts at at a really good uh, point in time. The materials can change and uh, we're finding with the material shortage in the Australian market at the moment, that builders are quite readily adapting from steel frame to timber frame or vice versa. We used to do everything in timber. You know, for the last 20 years, I've sworn that timber was the only option. Now that you can't get it, oh, steel, I love it. You know, it's straight and true and just what I need to build houses out of. Um, The answer is really neither of those. The answer is I have an economic machine that I need to keep running, so I'll plug in whatever I can to make it run. Yep. Okay makes sense um so with uh new houses Hmm. do you do you find that they're usually fill fitted with solar panels Um, it's a good point and we did a lot of work around a display uh example where we considered building it in a display village so in the middle of a greenfield uh developer parcel of land we gave serious thought to making this completely off-grid which and the technology is easily available and it's not a huge cost um, in the scheme of things. But we came to the conclusion that because we have a street there and because in that street there's a power connection running along it, that whether we're connected or not connected is still going to be right there. It's still going to exist in that street anyway. Uh, and the cost to access that on an annual basis if I never turned it on, is in the order of 400 bucks. I probably just should do that. Yep, that makes sense. It's going to be a lot easier. It it probably makes sense just to connect to the infrastructure if it's laid on. Yeah. Now, the circumstances are different if you're on a rural property and there is no power infrastructure and you're, you're, um, and of the 200,000 a year homes that are built, you know, there's a dozen of those that are truly in that situation that they're way remote, no, no infrastructure around. All right. So for you, do you think what does a sustainable city look like? Do you have any examples? There are definitely some thinking examples out there of master plans, whole cities. So Indonesia is talking about a whole new greenfield city. It comes back to interconnected villages and each of those villages have a particular theme And fundamentally, there hasn't been a new whole city built completely sustainably, as an example, and there are vast scale of thing to do. So it will take someone like, uh, and Saudi Arabia's got another example, um, where they're talking about a master planned sustainable city. Now, the Saudis probably have enough money to make that happen. Yep. Um, It is a huge, huge gamble, though. Because once you've built a city and you need to fine tune that, it becomes immensely complex and expensive to make changes. Yeah, of course. So it's sort of existing cities that we have, it's it's difficult to tweak, I suppose. So going back to our existing Australian cities, which, you know, we're not going to have leadership that says, here's, we're going to build a new city at Cooper PD. It'll be completely off-grid, sustainable and whatever, uh, because we've found this rare earth product there that is going to save the world. That isn't going to happen, even if that material turns up. 
but we can do an enormous amount of good with existing houses, again, just with applying some thinking. In some cases, it might be as simple as putting a white roof on or a higher reflective roof than a dark coloured roof. Yeah, I've actually heard that they're changing the law in New South Wales to Mm. make it illegal for dark roofs. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a good conversation piece. When talking about products, we have to start from where the, where the, the recipient of this conversation is at. So I'm going to propose that I possibly know a little bit more about products than most people in this conversation. And I need to start where you're at rather than where I'm at. Right. Which makes sense. Yep. So a dark coloured roof, is it inherently good or is it inherently bad? Coming from a no knowledge basis about the colour of roofs. You'd probably just be thinking about the aesthetics, right? (laughs) Yeah. So the first response is, you know, lighter colours reflect more sun and thermally are better. Yep. Um, Now, that's not true for all cases. And that doesn't then follow that all houses need to change their roofs to a lighter coloured roof to be more reflective. But it's a good starting point. Okay. There are cases where... I would certainly argue you can have a black roof would be a great idea. Okay. Can you give an example of that? Yeah. So if you're in a high moisture environment and that moisture leads to mould buildup in your, on your roof space, um, having the most heat absorbed into the roof cladding will kill the mould and might be a better outcome for the longevity of your roof. Right. Okay. That's a really great example. Thanks for that. (laughs) Um, So moving away from residents and and residential homes, what do you think our retail like strips and shopping malls would look like? We have some incredible ability to network now. Um, So, and maybe we start thinking about computers so that we can join them together and have this immense power with a network system. Similar applies in a commercial building space. And and we would all know examples when we go to supermarkets and we find incredible cold spots and incredible hot spots walking through a commercial space. And unfortunately, most of those buildings are managed to the weakest link. So we always find it hot here. So we crank the thermostat down to get down to a comfortable temperature there. And you'll find bank tellers wearing their Uh, cardigans or jackets or jumpers inside the commercial facility because it's too cold for them. So the the design layout is not necessarily... Part of its layout, part of its mechanics. Typically, those HVAC systems in commercial buildings have an incredible wastage factor um, and aren't maintained all that regularly. Um, Again, it's down to a compliance thing. People are doing the minimum level of maintenance of their air conditioning system. But you know, have you driven your car with a minimal amount of maintenance as opposed to when it was freshly tuned? Now, there's a vast difference in the two things, but yep. you only pay for the minimum you know, maintenance level of your car. Yep. Much the same with a commercial building. Okay. Um, do you think that the brick and mortar retail stores are declining? So I am not a wealthy person by any stretch. So <laughs> this is all a completely hypothetical thing. Yeah. But if I was to own commercial space, I would be trying to get out of it at a desperate rate of knots. Um, not only because the structure itself is potentially old thinking and old, you know, inefficient building, right? But we've just proven categorically that we can work not there, um, and we can still shop, not there. Uh, and what the outcome of this pandemic worldwide is will, will absolutely change commercial space requirement. Yeah, what definitely. It, what it will change it to, I don't know. Um, but there's already uh, here in Brisbane um, tower units that were built for the sole purpose of international student accommodation. So those owners are now already making the argument that they would like to have it rezoned to allow for commercial space, allow for motel accommodation, as well as their student accommodation. Right. 
but they Is don't the want any of the compliance cost that goes with the rezoning. Of course not, because that would cut into the profits. <laughs> and because it can't actually be done. Oh, okay. So it's not so, really feasible to... So structurally, you can't change it from this single-purpose tower to this thing over here and be compliant. Yep. Because okay. this thing over here has a commercial retail space requirement, which might have, you know, fire sprinkler systems or, you know, more exits per square metre of floor area, et cetera, and a student, international student accommodation doesn't have the same level of requirement. You can't reverse engineer that, and certainly not economically. Yeah. Do you think that the one of the potential solutions to that is to raise the requirements of international accom or student accommodation to be more in line with what we have for other places? Then they don't exist. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so it just so then they're not commercially viable. Yeah. Yeah. So our typical model is we only do things when it's commercially viable. Mm -hmm. And we don't actually consider the cost to the human. So it makes sense to build this. I'm not trying to pick on any particular person. Like I do stuff based on commerce. I need to, you know, I need to get paid for stuff. So I go and do that. I'm part of this system. But um, yes, we could raise the bar. Uh, ultimately, commerce is driven by where's the lowest cost niche that I can get into the marketplace to make the maximum amount of profit. Yeah. It, do, it doesn't lead to good human outcomes. It's just, we're, we're just fishing for the opportunity. Yes. I've definitely, with, I've heard it said that regulations are written in blood because when you're just optimizing for financial gain. You absolutely. We can regulate for other outcomes. You know, it, we could say we need to build student accommodation to this happiness level. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a measurable outcome. Mm -hmm. There is an example of a, a massive accountancy firm, temporary escapes, and he starts with D. They were going to be a tenant of a commercial tower in Melbourne. So the commercial builder was building this big thing, and they said, uh, as a part of our lease agreement, we want a regulation that says the CO2 level in the space can't drop, can't increase above this level because we know that humans drop their performance when the CO2 level gets above this point. And we're an office full of accountants and they're all sitting at their desk. If they all go to sleep when the CO2 gets too high, we lose productivity, which is a direct commercial outcome. So you can regulate. Um, other than square metres of floor space and other than gross dollars per square metre lettable areas, you can write in other uh, elements into the agreement. Yeah, um, absolutely. You can consider those things that maybe people don't always consider but should. Hmm. Yes. All right. Um, last question for you. What is the biggest modification that li listeners at home can make to their house to be more sustainable? It's a really, really easy one. Okay. It costs nothing. Um, but to be more sustainable, just turn off a heap of stuff you've got on. Right. Use less energy, <laughs> essentially. Okay. Because it's, it, it's, our base load power is still coal-fired. Um, our things wear out the longer they're turned on. They consume power even on standby. Um, and we measured a split system air conditioner. So it turned off um, on the inside remote, completely off, not on standby, not waiting for a signal. The compressor outside is still chewing power. So completely isolated, made a measurable difference to the power consumption of the house. Wow, okay. All of those things have an isolator on them, go outside and turn them off, which will also reduce the likelihood that your teenager comes home from the gym Cranks the picks up the aircon and turns it down to eighteen degrees because they're hot from the gym. Yep. They won't have the the motivation to go outside and find the isolator and turn it back on and then go back inside and turn the air conditioner back on. They'll have lost that impetus, and they'll go maybe have a cold shower, maybe take the gym gear off, maybe actually just spend ten minutes and cool down. So basically, think about your use of, of power and whether you really. Needed, or you're just doing it because it's 
convenient and easy. Yeah. So remotes are uh, incredibly convenient. Yeah. Um, but not always necessary. And and our uh, you know really really simple things set your air conditioner at um, a higher temperature. Set it at twenty three, or I actually set mine at twenty five. Uh, but I am used to the tropics, so that's perhaps a bit more than most people are comfortable with. But um, it saves an immense amount of power. Right. Much much like driving your car, you drive at one hundred kilometers an hour. And then you drive at 110 kilometers an hour, you'll see a massive increase in fuel consumption. Modern cars all have that fuel flow capability. Just have a look at it, and it makes a big difference. Do you think that there's a difference? Um, like if people will say, Oh, well, my house is fully like I only use solar panels, it's fully powered by that. that it, you know, like if they're justification for that power use or do you think that that's still a thing that they should try and cut down so typically um so 40 years ago i'm going to use an illustration we used a, a power cable like that dimension mm -hmm. to connect the house today we use a power cable that dimension to connect each house now it's not because you're always using it at the full capacity you're mostly using it, but you you ramp up to this huge capacity. Yep. Um, in a particular area, we spoke to the utility provider and said, you know, we've all heard about gold plating poles and wires and infrastructure for electricity. And it's billions and millions of dollars spent for us to have 100% of the time reliable power connection. What would happen if we said we, were, we would accept 80% of the time reliable power connection? And they would say it would more, it, it would something like half the cost of infrastructure. Right, okay. So in actual fact, we build this infrastructure and in the example I was, we were talking to the supplier, they said it's four hours of a year that you use it at that capacity. You use Not this network. Much. <laughs> for a whole year, for four hours, and we can tell you when it is, December the 25th, midday. Really? Because we will have all of our guests over and they all crowd inside in the air con. And we roast a lunch. And we roast, yeah, make it really, really hot so it's very inefficient. <laughs> yep. So that's when the peak is, and there's outrage if my power goes off, particularly on Christmas Day, um, and yeah, we've, we've given ourselves this expectation that we should always have power available all the time just to flick all these switches. Mm -hmm. How many internet connected devices do you have in your house today? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it used to be a single uh, dial up modem, single yeah. line connection. Yeah. But now, now everything. Now everything is internet connected. Your modem is using about the same power as a incandescent globe on 24-7. Right. So a 40-watt um, lamp running constantly. So definitely just trying to reduce those levels and, and think about the necessity of, of what you're doing. Being conscious, just being conscious of your energy consumption would be an enormous start to being sustainable for all of us design your habits into your routine rather than relying on people turning off every light switch. Um, it is possible to build a house uh, that has just a single switch that you flick as you press your roller door to go out the roller door to work and it turns off all the standby um, right. appliances in the house. You can just hardwire that into the house. You can make it a pretty colour. Here's the green switch. I flick that and I turn them all off. Um, but it leaves your fridge and leaves your freezer running. Um, so you would dedicate which appliance you do and don't want to be yep. turned off. Th that at time of build is negligible cost. Is that expensive to install later after the fact? Quite problematic after the fact because your wiring circuit has to suit. So mostly it doesn't suit. Um, okay. However, there are apps and smart internet plugs so we're now back to consuming a whole bunch of other things 
Um, but you can put little, uh, you can replace your PowerPoint with a smart PowerPoint. You can get an app on your phone and you can just turn all your standby stuff off via the app and you can do that anywhere. Yep. So if a teenager says he's gone to school and uh, you're at work and get the app out and turn all your standby power off and then get a disgruntled you know, message from your teenager, the aircon's gone off. Oh, well, you know they're not at school. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, but, that, but that's absolutely available. But some of those things have a, a input cost, so we you need to make modification. Um, but changing your GPO plate on the wall to a, a internet connected one, more internet connected devices, might be the way to achieve that. And and people often start with the iron at home. I'm always nervous about I've left the iron on when I leave the house. Change that one to start with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't think I've ever been concerned about that, but because <laughs> I always unplug. <laughs> yeah, it, each of us, uh, it's, it's different a common habits. Enough, yeah, common enough story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely get that. Okay. All right. Well, I think that that's all. I mean, that's been about an hour. So mm -hmm. we'll probably cut off there. Um, yeah. But thank you very much for, for joining us and having this conversation. It's been awesome. very illuminating. Hopefully it's helped and hopefully you can get something out of that that's useful, Rebecca. It's, um, I massively enjoy this space. The thinking and the conversation is the part that we need to do lots yeah, and lots definitely. more. Um, the nuts and bolts, the practitioner side of things is relatively, any builder can follow the steps and the knowledge that I have. Um, it's not unique or special or I'm not particularly gifted, uh, far from it. So anyone can follow this. You just yep. need to have a desire to follow it. Yeah. Just got to have that motivation to, mm. to care and think about yep. it. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And it was lovely to talk to you. Likewise, Rebecca. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.